التحرير في الدول لا لا التحرير 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 بتاع التحقيق ديالنا بهذا كاين وي غو جو اجين ستارت ذا نيكست سيشن اسك ايفرون تو كيف ار سيتس Looking forward to this session, which is going to focus specifically on Tunisia and the question of can Tunisia succeed as a model. Uh, Tunisia has been viewed by most observers uh, over the last couple of years as you know, there's been sort of broad consensus that in many respects Tunisia has advantages that some of the other countries of the Arab Spring that are undergoing democratic transitions now uh, do not have, and it's you know widely regarded as sort of the best opportunity for a successful uh, transition to democracy. Um, having said that, uh, Tunisia nonetheless has encountered uh, plenty of uh, difficulties and challenges uh, and sort of ups and downs over the last couple of years. Uh, I've had the opportunity to travel out to Tunisia uh, frequently myself over the last couple of years and it's been uh, you know, a, a very uh, fascinating uh, example uh, of a country trying to make this transition. Um, and you know, I, I think during 2011-2012, Tunisia had you know, pretty remarkable progress in, in, in its transition and moving forward. It had elections. You know, it, it was not only the, the first place in which wide, you know, wide protest emerged uh, beginning the, the Arab Spring. It also was the first country to get to free, free and fair elections. Uh, in October 2011, for a constituent assembly that was tasked with writing its constitution. Um, I think at the end of 2011, early 2012, uh, the prognosis in general in Tunisia was, was, was quite, uh, quite positive. Uh, since then, um, you know, there have been some difficulties. Uh, the mandate for the Tunisian Constituent Assembly initially was for one year. Uh, the goal was to have a constitution uh, written within one year. That would have been by October 2012. Uh, but uh, today, kind of debate and discussion continues uh, regarding its constitution. Uh, Tunisia also was hailed uh, in late 2011, early 2012 as a unique example uh, of parties working across uh, ideological boundaries. There was a, uh, the Nahda party, an Islamist party, uh, won the largest share of seats in the Constituent Assembly, uh, and it immediately formed a, a coalition, a troika, with two other parties that were uh, largely seen as sort of secular liberal, liberal parties, and this was hailed as an as important example. Uh, but today we've seen uh, sort of increasing uh, polarization, uh, and we've seen some incidents of political violence uh, that have caused some concern, uh, including most notably the assassination of an outspoken opposition voice, uh, Shukri Balaid, uh, early this year. Uh, so today we're going to have uh, four panelists that are going to help us examine different aspects of the challenges being faced in Tunisia, and sort of you know, offer uh, their contribution to the picture of can, uh, whether Tunisia can succeed as a democratic model uh, for the region. Uh, our first speaker uh, this morning is going to be uh, Joël Fiss. Uh, Joël is uh, working with the organization uh, Human Rights First. Uh, she is going to focus especially on uh, blasphemy laws, freedom of expression, and uh, what we can learn from, from Tunisia's experience uh, in that regard. Uh, our second speaker is going to be uh, Alexander Martin. Uh, Alexander is uh, working now on his uh, PhD at the Durham University in the UK. Uh, he's going to focus uh, for us on uh, building common ground for democratization in Tunisia through the development of civil society and civil political culture. Uh, our next speaker will be uh, Radwan Masmoudi, who you all know as the, the head of uh, the CSIB. He's going to uh, speak on building a stable democracy in Tunisia, what will it take? Uh, and then our, our final speaker uh, will be uh, John Kerry uh, of Dartmouth University. He will be uh, presenting to us, uh, looking at Tunisia's electoral formula and the Tunisian Constituent Assembly. Uh, I, I had the pleasure about six weeks ago of attending uh, CSID's conference in Tunis, uh, and I, or attending most of that conference, and unfortunately I had to miss a couple of sessions because of uh, uh, conflicts that, that I had, uh, and I unfortunately missed uh, John's presentation on uh, the electoral formula and the Constituent Assembly uh, in Tunis, and I'm very much looking forward to, to um, hearing his presentation today. Uh, so uh, with that, we'll go ahead and uh, get started with Joel. Thank you. Thank you. It's an honor to speak here, and so the timing of this conference couldn't be better. Um, the, the revolution 
in Tunisia has opened up so many opportunities uh, for its society, for the promotion of human rights and democracy, and uh, it is a very uh, creative uh, and reflective moment. And uh, what I would like to, to do to participate in this creativity and reflection is to discuss the question of blasphemy and the, and the use of blasphemy laws, which uh, according to the work that um, I have made and, and, and my organization, Human Rights First, we believe is really a threat to democracy. So we've worked on blasphemy for several years. We've been monitoring blasphemy laws across many countries in the world. We've been reporting cases. We've been working at the United Nations. And in our view, any law that criminalizes um, any speech that insults religion or denigrates the prophet or denigrates Islam does not help for a smooth democratic transition. In fact, it creates obstacles to democratic development. It polarizes society and it empowers extremists, which is exactly what uh, the Tunisians do not want to um, find their, themselves in, in their situation now. A few statistics about blasphemy. So we've reported about 200 cases only between 2010 and 2013. Um, the cases where there are the most prominent human rights abuses caused by blasphemy laws are in Pakistan. There are many cases also in Egypt and Indonesia. And we've reported five cases in Tunisia, and they all come from 2012. So I'm not saying that there were no blasphemy cases before the revolution. I'm just saying that in the English and French-speaking media, the only cases that we've found, uh, are, uh, have, which have been reported, are five cases in Tunisia in 2012. And, and that means that there are more cases in Tunisia at this point than in Jordan, than in Algeria, and then in Morocco, for example. So this is a growing problem, and so it's something that um, we believe that the Tunisians should look at closely. So blasphemy laws are used to suffocate discussion, to stifle freedom of speech. They enable governments to uh, decide what ideas are acceptable and what ideas are not acceptable. And so as, an, as, 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 as a reflection of that, it, it can often cause outbreaks of mob violence as well. And that was the case in, in, the, in the Tunisian blasphemy cases, as you'll see. It's become common for mobs to try and intimidate uh, uh, alleged, uh, um, uh, people, uh, alleged victims of blasphemy. Sometimes mobs gather outside courtrooms. Uh, mobs have descended on towns trying to injure residents. It's, it's very, very complicated and uh, it, it, it is a source of consistent violence. You will see, for example, there are some cases in Tunisia where uh, in September 2012, two, two people were killed and 29 others were wounded when police fought hundreds of protesters who vandalized the US embassy in Tunisia over the film Innocence of Muslims. You will recall in June 2012, when protesters attacked the Palais Abdelia in Tunis, where a modern contemporary art exhibition was being held, and um, death threats were issued to the exhibitors, riots were in the street, caused a lot of mayhem and, and unrest, and that was probably the most unrest since the, the 2011 revolution. There were other cases as well, bloggers um, sentenced to seven and a half years of, to jail for publishing books that criticize Islam in March 2012, and also the owner of a TV station in May 2012, who was accused of blasphemy after the um, TV uh, film Persepolis was, uh, was aired on his show. So these are cases where, which have really led to violence in Tunisia. And it's cr increased instability, it's increased religious tensions, and it's opposed citizen against citizen. It, uh, it has also forced the government and the law enforcement authorities to take sides. And so that's a lose-lose situation for national unity which is the priority right now for the, for the Tunisian society. And so it empowers extremists to impose their vision onto others, uh, it causes violence, and these laws uh, polarize Tunisian society in a moment when it is seeking national unity. The state and the police are often caught in the middle, they're forced to take sides, uh, that necessarily leads to discontent, necessarily one part of the population will be antagonized, so there is a, a you know, there is, there is a lot of domestic turmoil. But beyond the domestic turmoil, there's also international turmoil. Um, you will recall, you know, when Tunisia's, when the blasphemy case in Tunisia, which led to the attack of the US Embassy in Tunis, went way beyond Tunisia's borders. And so when there were protests, the film uh, Innocence of Muslims that created such mayhem in Tunis, and which 
uh, you know, that had uh, effects outside of Tunisia's borders. And President Obama at the General Assembly in 2012 even had to spend 20 minutes of his time at the General Assembly discussing the question of blasphemy, reiterating the importance of freedom of expression. And so this goes way beyond Tunisia as well. It is often said, and those who defend blasphemy laws, uh, often say that it is a form of incitement to hatred, and so therefore it should be part of international law, and it should be accepted. It is the Islamic version of incitement laws in Europe, for example. But that is incorrect, because uh, the concept of intent is crucial in international law when judges determine what is incitement. So therefore there always needs to be an intent when when trying to advocate hatred, and so you need to examine uh, the intent which is punishable. In the world of blasphemy, that's not at all the case. Uh, it's not the intent that's punishable, rather how the speech is received by the receptor. So this encourages people to feel self-entitled to use violence and to take justice in their own hands. So the more you're offended, the more you can resort to accusing someone of blasphemy. And so that, that is international law in reverse. It's not, it's not the way that, um, that, that the concept of intent and incitement is applied. Also, there's extreme politicization of blasphemy. Yet again, let's use the example of the innocence of Muslims. Uh, when this video was first posted on YouTube in July 2012, nobody even noticed it. And then a few months later, just before 9-11, uh, the 9-11 anniversary, it, the video was translated, this Islamophobic video was translated into Egyptian Arabic, it was posted again on YouTube, and it was instrumentalized so that extremists could blame the violence that they were using on the obscenity of the video, if you wish. And so uh, the, the video was blamed for the violence, it was the extreme politization of blasphemy, and there was no imminence between the speech that was articulated and the consequences which occurred uh, two or three months later. So you can't establish a link, as you can in international law, about what somebody says and the immediate consequences that speech has. Um, I, uh, I just want to say a few more things about what Tunisia can do to provide some legal recommendations to the Tunisians. First of all, we, we think it's wonderful that the blasphemy clause has not been introduced in the draft constitution. We very much hope that no blasphemy clause will be introduced in the Tunisian constitution. And also in the post-constitutional phase, we hope that the legal framework will continue to make sure that uh, criminalization of speech is very narrowly defined under international law and that uh, freedom of speech prevails. So that's very important. We also think that it's very important that Tunisians at this important period of their time make clear in law that violence is absolutely an unacceptable response to any form of speech and that there should be no sense of self-proclaimed right to express violence behavior or to cause bloodshed if one deems offended by, by speech that does not conform to the requirements of incitement. Um, we, uh, we call on, on the Tunisians to protect and ensure all those whose lives are threatened and endangered on account of blasphemy, including parliamentarians, including government officials, lawyers and journalists who speak out against blasphemy laws. It's very important as well to provide clarity at the top level of government down to all law enforcement officials, judges and lawyers, so that their security will be protected and guaranteed by the state when working on cases related to blasphemy without any fear of prospective intimidation of extremists. And, and that should be a message that comes from the top and that trickles right down so that uh, the citizens can feel safe and build this trust between the law enforcement authorities and themselves. Finally, to guarantee equal protection under the law without discrimination for all individuals. And it goes without saying that we call on the United States to stand firmly behind Tunisia in support of this as well. Um, and uh, you know, since this blasphemous incident which caused the, the US uh, mission in Tunis to be attacked, the US embassy has been reduced uh, in terms of its staff members. So blasphemy has had a concrete impact on US-Tunisia relations. And it is very important that the US steps up to re-engage, to reinforce its staff within the mission to assist civil society in this crucial historical moment. And uh, we, um, we, we hope that the Tunisian example will, will be 
you know, discussed and learned across, uh, across the world in this exciting period for the country. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Joe. Uh, Alex? Okay, um, good morning. Um, I'd like to thank Rabban Ross Moody and the CSID for giving me the opportunity to speak at this conference. Um, this talk offers ideas and concepts that the theoretical literature on civil society presents and the forms in which civil society operates most effectively. Fieldwork I've conducted in Tunisia has suggested to me certain kinds of issues and arguments which relate to this theoretical literature. Um, the issue I would like to present is the way in which civil society organisations, or CSOs, um, can be a force for the encouragement and development of democratic practices and norms within the society of the state. By civil society, I'm referring to the zone of a voluntary associative life beyond family and clan ties and separate from the market, and the autonomous collection of volunteeristic organisations and associations that pursues public ends in relation to but not seeking to overthrow the state. These definitions are referring to interest groups, NGOs, membership organizations that are not state controlled and its members have joined out of choice rather than they, because they're part of a certain ethnic, religious or kinship group. Uh, Robert Putnam argued that civil society is crucial to making democracy work and that democratic government is strengthened, not weakened when it faces a vigorous civil society. This is because civil society holds the state to account and enables uh, society to reach agreement on its values and norms. However, civil society itself is not guaranteed to be sufficient. It is wrong to assume that strong civil society ensures democracy. Um, however, I would like to present the case put forward by Putnam, which states that the chances of becoming democratic on a national level are far greater if civil society organisations become internally democratic themselves. And Telus incurs with this, um, arguing that without well-developed civil society, it is difficult, if not impossible, to have an atmosphere supportive of democracy. Um, now I'd like to introduce the concept of civility. Um, civil and uncivil behaviour is a question of political culture. Um, the political culture of a society consists of the system of empirical beliefs, expressive symbols and values, which defines the situation in which political action takes place. Civility is the tolerance, uh, the willingness of individuals to accept disparate views and social attitudes, um, to accept the profoundly important idea that there is no right answer, or the mutual accommodation of difference in everyday dealings. Civility was described by um, Augustus Norton as being absent from the Arab world. Um, but considering that civility since Armin and Berber's work in 1963, the civic culture, um, is widely considered to be the political culture of democracy, the society and organisations within a state would be required to adopt this and to allow all voices to be heard, to prevent oppression and to allow democracy to function. So civil society needs two things. It needs a state that will um, protect the civil society from uncivil elements or incivility and civil society needs to be protected from the state Therefore, the state itself needs to be self-limiting. Um, but what is incivility? Um, political incivility is the unwillingness to respect, tolerate, and cooperate with persons whose groups um, and viewpoints differ from one's own. Uh, Carothers and Cassian question the normative assumption that all members of civil society are in fact civil, instead of noting that many groups belonging to civil society are rather uncivil, and are certainly not pro-democratic or pro-human rights. Um, for an active, independent civil society to exist and operate freely, the state must offer a balance of protection for civil society from both excessive um, state innovation and uncivil elements within society. This can be achieved through drafting and passing legislation, legislation that guarantees protection and freedom for CSOs to operate. Hefner presents uh, this point by arguing that the state must guarantee the rights and the freedoms of its citizens in the face of the power hungry and the intolerant. Um, this legalization or this legislation should probably um, include guarantees, um, guaranteed protection of democratic norms like freedom of speech, freedom of association, and requirement to be uh, financially transparent. So, wh why does civility matter? Because pluralism, equality, and tolerance. Freedom are the group 
held beliefs or norms that underpin democracy. A democratic system does not only consist of political parties, institutions, and elections. Tolerant civil practice um, and the development of civil political culture are also essential components. Regarding civil society, in a situation where freedom of speech is present, but civility is lacking, the public sphere um, is at risk of becoming a fragmented, incoherent cacophony of voices, incapable of providing normatively based consensus on what constitutes the legitimate manifestation of sovereign power. So how is civility adopted? It, simply through norms and practices. If um, organisations are operating around personalistic politics, um, so if this is stopped, if democratic norms and processes are embedded, um, civil political culture should theoretically begin to develop. Um, Salome previously described Arab civil society as democracy without democrats, arguing that um, democratic structures may exist, but the people operating within them do not follow democratic norms. Um, is civility therefore some sort of European or Western historical experience? Um, authors like Gellner, amongst others, had argued that civil society is not relevant to non-Western societies. However, others, including Hefner, disagree, saying it's um, a cross-cultural principle that is not region-specific. Instead, looking at the structures of organisations, um, horizontal structuring of organisations creates conditions in which there is a high probability of um, democratic principles being adopted. Um, Putnam argues that in the majority of cases, um, vertical organisation structures are more frequently less civil and less democratic. Um, patterns of organisation that prioritise and valorise age, seniority and paternal authority enforce a culture of patrimonialism where the power is concentrated and exercised by a single leader. Um, furthermore, this patrimonial system was actually supported by authoritar authoritarian states, which enforced vertical power structures and fostered uncivil political cultures. Um, Hawthorne summarises this um, as follows. Um, after Arab countries gained independence, new regimes feared that pluralistic, independent, associative life would undermine national unity and threaten their own attempts to consolidate power. Thus, independent civic activity was brought under tight control as civil society organisations were transformed into state-dominated institutions or were simply repressed. So, um, when, civic, uh, when civil society is weakened in such a way, this leads to a lack of civic engagement and a lack of social trust. So, horizontally or laterally organised organisations, where members are elected, and progress through the system through merit or through ability rather than through their name are more conducive to democracy. This is because um, horizontal uh, systems enable <coughs> the best ability rather than the best connections or a certain family name to rise through the ranks. Um, this means that a mutuality needs to occur. Um, civil society um, organisations need to operate um, democratically to internalise the practices and operations of democracy to ensure that civil, the civility or a civil political culture develops. In addition, state legislation uh, that provides protection for civil society from uncivil elements and from too much state intervention is also required. <coughs> These two factors combined will potentially um, allow the, uh, the public sphere to operate harmoniously in which um, civility is able to flourish. Um, so going to my fieldwork on Tunisia, this initially suggests that um, the political culture of some, if not all, political parties, oh sorry, some but not all, um, political parties and CSOs is not democratic because they lack these democratic norms and practices. For example, they do not hold internal elections. Furthermore, um, some parties and CSOs fail to create um, alliances because there is a lack of trust between parties and organisations and therefore an inability, inability to collaborate and uh, coordinate around shared interests. They, um, some of these groups are organised on personalistic politics um, and in some cases individuals look to secure their own prestige within the organisation. Um, furthermore, in some cases ego is holding uh, people, parties and organisations back from uh, 
and making them join forces. And certain members would rather be a president or a leader of a small organization than a vice president in a larger organization. Um, the political culture of a nation is often influenced by the culture of the ruling elite. It is therefore feasible that an element of this uncivil uh, behaviour in civil society can be attributed to the decades of influence under authoritarian regime and the previous dictatorial tendencies. So, um, regarding the issue of building common ground between sort of secularists and Islamists, which seems to be the main split in Tunisia at the moment, it is highly unlikely that political agreement between these two will be reached. However, this should not be regarded as a problem. What is important is the manner and the fashion in which interaction occurs. A common ground um, that could be um, agreed on is the rules of political engagement interaction. Agreeing the rules of the game, not in an instrumental way, but in a way because these rules will protect everyone. Um, the secularist Islamist ide ideological polarization should not be allowed to prevent the more important shared objective of creating a democratic system where voices are respected um, from being achieved. The common ground is also understanding um, not just the relationship between the state and civil society, but also um, understanding that it does not matter if Islamists, um, an Islamist group or a secularist um, group are in the government. The state has to protect the civil society organisations with a contrary ideological stance to their own and still treat them as valid partners. In addition, it is necessary for these civil society organisations themselves to agree the condition of mutual respect towards other CSOs, even if they have a different ideological stance. Focusing on the ideological divide that currently is in Tunisia is preventing civil society as a whole um, from securing a state which protects all. Um, the state has to protect civil society from excessive state intervention. This ensures that there is a space, a public sphere, in which the state does not interfere and not try and control. For example, the way that the state tries to censor media. Um, however, there is no optimum or perfect relationship between the state and civil society. It must be negotiated. And for this negotiation to take place, a balance must be found and therefore civility is required. Society as a whole has to decide what uncivil practice is. Therefore, the state cannot impose a belief system on the population. Um, CSOs must be tolerant of each other to even have these debates. Um, other organisations should therefore not be feared and others should certainly not be silenced either. Um, all CSOs should therefore consider becoming more reflexive and address their own structures, organisation and norms to make themselves democratic. Furthermore, I suggest this, um, the need for CSOs to look inwards and democratise themselves before they look outwards and criticise others um, of their own of their <laughs> democratic, um, democratic uh, credentials. Thank you. Now I'll turn to round one. Thank you, Steve. <coughs> And, uh, good morning, everyone. I'll try to be very brief. Um, as uh, some of you have been with CSID or have attended CSID events and conferences for the last 14 years, to summarize my talk, it's basically uh, CSID from theory to practice. For the last 12 years before the Arab revolutions, we mostly have been talking about theory. Uh, last two years we're talking about practice. How do we put all the theory that we've been talking about for the last 12 years into practice? Uh, for example, CSID, as you know, for the last 12, 14 years has, has focused on two major activities in the Arab world. First one is dialogue between Islamists and secularists. And we started this 14 years ago. We have organized literally hundreds of meetings and seminars before the Arab Spring between Islamists and secularists, trying to develop consensus, trying to develop a, a joint common vision for a democratic uh, system, for a democratic society, how they can agree on working together to build a true democratic uh, uh, government and, and, and framework. So as you know, now, uh, and mo many of these meetings were very successful, but they were mostly about theory. It's easier to agree when you're talking about theory, now they, they are talking about practical uh, issues. 
And so we're still talking about the same things, but in a very, very practical uh, dimension. Also, one pillar of CSID activities for the last 14 years has been democracy education and citizenship education and how we train people, not just the elite, not, that, not just the intellectuals and the scholars and the experts, the common citizen about what is citizenship, what, what does it mean, how, do, how, how does he become or he or she become involved in the political system, what are the responsibilities and the duties, not only the rights of a citizen, we have trained, even before the Arab Spring, over 10,000 people in, in these small workshops, not only in Tunisia, but throughout the Arab world. Small workshops of 25 people each for three days, training them on citizenship and, and, and all these values that we're talking about today, about what it means to be a citizen and, and what, uh, how you build a state really built on citizenship. So, uh, after uh, the revolution, I want to focus now about Tunisia, because after these uh, revolutions, uh, CSID made uh, a conscious decision to focus on Tunisia. Uh, before the revolution, we were, we were active in uh, all over the Arab, Arab countries, from Morocco to Yemen to Jordan. Uh, but after the revolution, we, we really made a conscious decision to focus on Tunisia. So I want to say why, very quickly, why we, we, we took that decision because we, we think and we feel, based on the 12 years before that, that Tunisia has the best chance of success. There is no guaranteed success anywhere, as we are finding out and as we are learning. This is a very, very difficult process. Mm -hmm. All of us, all Tunisians, all Arabs are finding out now, and this is what you hear everywhere in the streets, that it's much more difficult to build a democracy than to remove a dictator. This is the slogan that everybody agrees on right now. It was difficult to remove Ben Ali or Mubarak. It took us 30 years and a lot of sacrifices. But building a democracy is even much more, much more difficult and much more challenging. So these are truly historic times in the Arab world. Very, very uh, challenging, very difficult uh, historic times because you don't know where to begin. There is so much to do. And there is so little time and there is so little patience. And the enemies of democracy are still there. And they're still powerful. So I believe that the revolution did not occur two years ago. It started two years ago. And we are in the middle of the revolution right now, or maybe still even in the beginning of the revolution, and of the, certainly of the transition. So we believe that Tunisia has to succeed for democracy to take roots in the Arab world. We cannot fail in Tunisia. It's the easiest of the cases. If it doesn't work in Tunisia, it's not going to work elsewhere in the Arab world. So this is why we took that decision uh, to focus on Tunisia. So very briefly, here's the challenge. Let me explain very, very quickly why it's difficult. Ideally, in my opinion, political change occurs slowly and progressively through reforms. Through slow and progressive reforms, people, you build institutions, you build the culture of democracy, you build the culture of citizenship over a long period of time. And this is what we, all of us, would have preferred to see in Tunisia or in Egypt or in all these countries or in Libya. But unfortunately, these rulers refused any real reforms. In fact, in the last 20 years, all you know, it, it's easy to, uh, to argue that uh, there was no reforms at all, and in fact, we were going backwards. We were not, we were not improving, we were not getting in the, moving in the right direction. Things were getting worse and worse. That's the problem with dictatorship, is that they refuse reforms. They reject any real meaningful reforms until people are fed up and they explode. And that's when revolutions happen. Tunisians are very patient, and they were patient for 30 years, but at the end, people said, enough is enough. We cannot take this anymore. The problem with revolutions is that it happens so suddenly. And revolutions, as we know, are, could be messy, are usually violent, uh, are usually uh, unpredictable in many, in many respects. Uh, and, and, uh, and usually the problem with revolution is you basically you have to destroy the state, you have to destroy the regime and basically start over from scratch. Well, that's not easy. 
And that's very costly because destroying the regime means that you're, you're going to have anarchy, you're going to have chaos in the country. You can't really destroy the regime or, or, or destroy the state. And in a way, that's, that's, the, that's why revolutions are very costly and that's why people are very hesitant to go on revolutions. The price of revolutions is, is very high, as we saw in Iran or in France or in Russia or, or anywhere else. So I think what we are trying to do in Tunisia is find a middle ground between revolutions and reforms. Ideally, it should have been reforms. We had no choice. People had, you know, the, 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 the revolution happened. And now we're trying to balance the, the, the reforms with revolution. So we, we're trying to implement revolutionary reforms or reformist revolution. How do you, how do you fix the system over a period of time? The question in Tunisia, I think, is a question of pace. How do you pace yourself? How do you organize your priorities? There is so much to do. There are so many laws that need to be changed. Right now in the assembly, they have 60 laws, 60 new laws that are, that are waiting to be discussed and passed, but they have not had a chance to discuss them because they're busy with the constitution and busy with other things. So the question really is how fast do you go or how slow? Are we going too fast? Are we going too slow? And this is the real debate, I think, in Tunisia today. Some people are very upset that we are going too fast, and other people are very upset that, that we are going too slow. And I think finding the, the balance between the two is, is, is the challenge. For example, <coughs> writing the constitution. As Steve mentioned, originally it was intended to be done in one year. Is that too fast? Is that too slow? We are behind. There is no question that Tunisia is behind schedule in terms of the constitution. But what we are trying to do is find the right speed. Why? Because the writing the constitution is not just about getting 10 experts together and writing a new constitution. That can be done in one week or one month. The challenge in writing a constitution is building the, con the consensus between the people and between the various parties. That's what takes time. It's not just writing a constitution. Anybody can write a constitution. In, 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 and in fact, we started with like 20 different drafts from different parties or different experts or different organizations. They all had a complete draft of the, of the constitution. But the challenge is building the consensus, is the dialogue that has to take place between all the parties. This is why we are behind. This is why it was taking time. I, I, I think that's good. I think it's good that we take the time to have the dialogue because the constitution is the framework on which we're going to base the whole political system and rights and equalities and laws. All of that has to be based on the constitution. So it is very, very important that at the end of the day, when we have the constitution, there is a general consensus on the constitution. It's not a constitution for 50% of Tunisians or even 60% or even 70% of Tunisians. It's, it has to be a constitution for all Tunisians, and that's the difficulty, is getting the consensus around it. So there are many also challenges in terms of pacing ourselves or finding the right speed, changing the laws, as I mentioned. A lot of laws have to be changed, but we haven't even begun to, to do that. Transitional justice is a very big area and big topic in Tunisia, and we, have, we haven't even begun doing it, but again, you know, that's related to accountability and to justice. How do you hold people accountable without turning it into another dictatorship? Cleaning up and reforming the system. We all know the system right now is still filled with, with the same people who were serving under Ben Ali. I mean, there are few people who were removed at, at the extreme top, but almost everybody else is still in the, in the system. So how do you clean up that system and how do you replace people with people who are, or at least replace the people who are uh, uh, corrupt or who are involved in corruption or who are involved? So again, the, the basing of the reforms is what takes time. The media, reforming the media, reforming the judges and the judicial system. We heard earlier that the judicial system is the, is, is the basis of democracy. So you, we, it is important to have a really strong judicial system. 
But in the same, at the same time, we have inherited the old judicial system, which was part of the corruption of the, of the regime. And it is well known that at least 30%, some say up to 50% of the judges, I don't have exact statistics, used to accept bribes regularly and give sentences to the highest bidder. I mean, you have to pay, but it's not guaranteed you're going to win the case because if somebody else comes and pays more than you do, then, then you lose. And this is well known in Tunisia. So how do you reform the, the judicial system? I'm not saying all judges are like that, but a, a large number of people. So, um, how, so I think in general that Tunisia is on the right path, but it takes time and we have to be patient. And it's a question of pace. It's a question of how you, you go not too fast and not too, not too slow. I think we're going in the right direction because I think that we, have, we are building the consensus. And let me mention a couple of examples. I think one of the benefits that Tunisia has, and it has many benefits, and that's why I think democracy can succeed in Tunisia, is that we have a Nahda party which is one of the most moderate Islamic parties in the Arab world. Now, the secular Tunisians don't agree with that, of course, because they hate another, but that's the reality. There is no other Islamic party in the Arab world that is more moderate than Nahda, and, and that all the experts agree on this for the last 30 years. This is not new. This is well documented and well written. All the experts who have studied the Islamic movements for the last 30 years agree on this. For example, Nahda, from the beginning of the writing of the, of the constitution process, said we're not going to mention Sharia in the Constitution. From the beginning, from last March, when they just started, like one month after they started discussing the, the Constitution, they said we're not going to uh, insist or even require that we have Sharia mentioned at all, at all in the Constitution. Not even as one of the sources of legislation. As you know, in all other Arab countries, Sharia is either the main or the only source of legislation, or at least as one of the sources of legislation. To have an Islamic movement say, we don't want it even as a source of legislation, we don't, we don't want to mention it in the Constitution, I think is a really, really big deal. The second uh, proof is that Mahdad decided early on to, to work in a coalition with two secular parties. Now they realized that they are not ready to govern and they didn't want to govern alone and therefore they invited all other secular parties to join. Some accepted and some rejected, but at least two accepted. And, and therefore you have these, these two secular parties are part of the government and they are part of the assembly, the leader of the assembly, the, lead, the president himself, and of course within the government. And the last change in the government that we had just two months ago, um, Nada even gave up the, the sovereign ministries, the Ministry of Justice, the Ministry of Interior, the Ministry of uh, um, um, Foreign Affairs. the military, the defense. Uh, so there were four or five ministries, uh, Foreign Affairs, that were given to independent candidates who have no affiliation with any political party. And finally, on the Constitution itself, I think we, are, we have made a huge progress in the last year or year and a half in building consensus on the Constitution. I'm very optimistic that when we start to vote on the Constitution, which is in another week or two, uh, the Assembly is supposed to start voting on the Constitution, we will achieve, uh, not unanimity of course, there will always be people who, on the left or on the right who are not happy with it, but we will achieve over two-thirds majority in the Assembly. And this is very important. And Nahda has given up or has uh, made a lot of concessions on, on most items. And we will hear later from Rashid Ghanoushi this afternoon. And I've heard him in Tunisia speak many times on the Constitution. He said, we don't want to put in the Constitution anything on which we disagree. We only put in the Constitution what we agree on. Anything we disagree on, we remove it. It doesn't belong in the Constitution. So any item, anything that the secular groups or parties say, okay, we don't like this, we don't like that, okay, fine, take it out. And I think Nada is even risking losing some of its members and some of its support to the Salafis, 
and to the radical groups or the conservative groups within and of itself, because really when you read the Constitution right now, there is nothing Islamic about it. It doesn't mention secularism per se, but it's basically a secular constitution. There's almost nothing Islamic about it other than the first item or clause which we inherited from the previous clause, which is Tunisia is a, is a country uh, whose religion is Islam and whose language is Arabic. That's it. So I, I am very optimistic. Civil society also we heard about the importance of civil society. Civil society is thriving in Tunisia with almost no limits and no constraints other than, of course, you have to register yourself, but you can do it that in, in a couple of days or two or three days. So we have hundreds and thousands of new NGOs being established every day and very active all over the country. So for all these reasons, I'm really optimistic that Tunisia is going to make it. What I'm not, what I'm not optimistic about is the level of support that Tunisia is getting from the United States and from Europe. It's as if all of a sudden we don't care. I really don't understand it. I mean, there is some support, don't take me wrong, but it's very, very minimal. It is not what I expected. It's not what happened in other regions of the world, in Eastern Europe or, 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 or after the World War II, and there was, you know, massive support. I mean, we need to realize that we have a huge interest in what is happening in Tunisia today. The whole world does, has, a, has a huge interest. If Tunisia fails, the whole region will become a, a mess. But yet, I mean, there is some support, but I don't feel there is the, the level of, of enthusiastic support, at least on the economic level. Because at the end of the day, if the Tunisian people, especially the youth, don't think that their life, life is improving after the, the revolution, or that democracy has brought them some benefits, in terms of livelihood or jobs or economic, just to see some, some improvement. If their life becomes worse two or three years after the revolution and they say, well, really nothing changed, nothing improved, our life is worse, then I think there is a big risk that the old regime will, will come back and because people will say, okay, we didn't really benefit anything from democracy. So I think this is, this is the real danger, this is the real threat is on the economic level, and the lack of support, or the minimum support, not complete lack, but minimum support that Tunisia is getting uh, from the United States and from the European Union. Thank you very much. Hey, thanks. Now we're going to turn to John and look at the uh, electoral formula and its impact on Tunisia's constituent assembly. Okay. Thank you, Stephen, and I want to thank uh, Brad Wong and, and uh, CSID, everybody who, uh, who uh, works to make this conference possible, to give you the opportunity to speak to you today. Um, I'm going to start with uh, first a confession and then an apology. Um, the confession is that I'm not a Tunisia expert um, by any stretch. Um, I've, I've had the opportunity now to, to travel uh, twi twice to Tunisia, but only too, too briefly. Uh, it's not a part of the world or country that I've studied at length um, in, my, in my academic career. Um, so I hope to bring some perspective uh, today on um, you know, so the, a comparative elections perspective uh, to Tunisian politics, but I'm certainly not an expert in the history, the politics, the culture of the country, and so uh, in this room in particular, that's a kind of a daunting prospect. Um, the apology is that uh, I, I uh, thought that uh, I, I, I misunderstood the format and I, I prepared a, a presentation that was entirely uh, audiovisual dependent. Um, and, and discover that, that that's not uh, uh, available in the room. So I'm going to spend uh, much of my time describing the beautiful pictures uh, that you would be seeing and hoping that I can, uh, I can convey uh, some of the central points that I wanted to make. So, okay, but that, that's it by way of, uh, of housekeeping. Um, the, the, the first question I want to address today I think you're receiving a couple of the slides, or photocopies of a couple of the slides um, that I would have uh, showed you, and I'll try to describe the rest. Right. So the question I want to start with today is, what should we want from an electoral formula, and in particular in a developing democracy? So my focus today is going to be on the choices that Tunisia has already confronted and can, will continue to confront in establishing the rules for its elections, and in particular, 
rules for the election of the Constituent Assembly, and then going forward, rules for the election of a parliament, which inevitably is going to be a centerpiece of uh, Tunisian democracy as it develops. And, and I'm going to suggest that we ought to want five things, five general principles from uh, an electoral formula. The first one, or an electoral system, the first one is transparency. And by that I mean uh, really simplicity, that voters ought to be able to uh, go into the voting booth and understand uh, in a very direct way what's the menu of options being presented to them and what's the connection between the choice they make among those options and the formation of a government. So that's transparency. The second thing uh, that we should want in an electoral system is consistency. And by that I just mean that the, the electoral rules, the formula, if you want, for translating votes into seats ought to treat every party with the same amount of support equally. Okay, so there should be consistency across uh, groups in the way they're treated. The third thing that we should want from an electoral formula is that it should limit the distortions between vote the level of support among voters and the, and the, the level of representation, the percentage of seats that a, that a party gets uh, in an assembly. Uh, so it should avoid, for example, uh, uh, conferring huge bonuses on the, on the number one party that provide them perhaps with a supermajority in the parliament even though they may not have won a majority or, or, or certainly not a supermajority uh, of the vote. That's the third thing. The fourth thing is that the system ought to allow the opportunities for some level of individual accountability of politicians. Okay? It, should, it should provide voters some uh, way of being able to reward and punish individual politicians uh, based on their performance. And the fifth thing is that, and, and this is the one that uh, is, I think, um, most of interest in the Tunisian context right now, the fifth thing is that the, the electoral system ought to provide what I, I'm going to call economies of moderate scale. What do I mean by that? That requires a little more explanation. Um, what I mean by that is that the electoral rules should provide incentives for parties. And, and by when I use the word party, I mean a party, an alliance, a bloc, a movement, any group of politicians that get together to run, to compete for seats under a common banner. So economies of moderate scale mean that the system should provide incentives to form building blocks of viable governments. What do I mean by that? Well, the one way to think about it is with an example. You know, imagine you've got a party that expects to have 8% of support among the electorate. You've got another one that has, uh, expects to get 5% of support among the electorate. And maybe these two groups have sufficient overlap, you know, they, they, they share a sufficient number of principles that they might consider coalescing. And then all of a sudden, you go from party A and party B to coalition C with 13% uh, support among the electorate. Well, if they were to do that, um, economies of moderate scale means that they would expect to win at least as many seats banded together in coalition C as they would have won if they had stayed separate and run as party A. That's all economies of moderate scale. I mean, it means that um, as we move toward larger building blocks of you know, potentially governing groups, or at least the building blocks of, of potential governing groups, that we're going to reward coalition. And, and that's necessary in any developing democracy because, as we learned in the 2011 elections, you know, when you start, nobody knows how much support they've got. We don't know how much support there is for different visions and different groups and different leaders out there. And everybody throws his or her hat in the ring in the elections, um, and uh, you end up with dozens or maybe even hundreds, in the, as in the case of the Tunisian 2011 election, of different lists running. And you need, in a developing democracy, to move from that kind of fragmentation to the consolidation of a party system where you can have competing visions that viably could say, hey, if you support us, this is the vision that's going to govern the country. Okay. So the next thing I want to do is, is pay some kudos to the Tunisian electoral reformers of 2011 because I think that uh, the, the choice of an electoral system, in the choice of the electoral system for the constituent assembly, the Tunisian electoral engineers did some really important things right. Uh, and these should not be underestimated. And they, in fact, I think they, by far, uh, they, they've chosen so far the best electoral system among the, the, the Arab Spring democracies and actually within, across the whole region. 
I want to focus on three things that they did right, in my estimation. First thing is that they chose a single-tier, single-vote system. So Tunisian voters go into the, they go to the polling place and they get a ballot and they just make a single choice about it. It's not a multi-tier, multi-vote system like in Egypt or in Libya uh, or the Palestinian Authority when they last had their assembly elections, for example. Um, so the level of transparency for voters is very high. Second thing that they did is they chose uh, list proportional uh, representation. Um, and this limits the electoral distortions, the distortions between vote, uh, voter support and, and uh, representation in the parliament. Um, and the third thing that they did, uh, that in, in my estimation was a very good thing, was that they chose, they, they established electoral districts of moderate district magnitude. When I use the word magnitude, I'm referring to the number of representatives elected for a given district. And um, the, in, in Tunisia, um, they, uh, mo for the most part, the governorates serve as the electoral districts, but in the cases of the larger, more populated, heavily populated governorates, uh, they broke them up into, in, into two separate districts, Tunis and Sfax, um, and, and kept the number of representatives per district reasonably small, large enough to allow for proportionality, large enough to allow uh, minority parties to win some representation, but small enough that the number of representatives is limited per district, and that gives voters the ability to uh, demand some level of individual accountability. So these are really important, great choices that were made in 2011. Um, and um, and I, I want to um, acknowledge that first. I'm going to come back to that uh, at the end of my comments today. So the first uh, piece of paper, the first slide that you have that looks something like this, gives you, in a sense, the sort of uh, statistical box score on the 2011 Constituent Assembly elections. Uh, just to give you a sense of what the field of competitors looked like, what the distribution of the vote looked like, and so forth. And you can see that the, the Constituent Assembly has 217 seats in it. Um, Tunisia itself uh, is divided into, uh, well, the, Tunisia is divided into 27 different uh, electoral districts. Most of them correspond to governorates. The few are uh, broken up at, at a lower level. And then there are six um, uh, districts abroad for expatriate voters in Europe, Middle East, and so forth. Um, in the election of 20, uh, 2011, 560 different uh, lists or alliances ran candidates. Now, more than 400 of these lists ran in only one district. So many of them are just small local organizations. Only 10 of them managed to run lists in more than 25 of the 33 districts. And only four of them ran lists in every district. So um, there, you've got a, a few big players and then a huge, long uh, field of much smaller players here. What I did in my, in my study of the 2011 elections, I asked two questions. First of all, how much difference did it make? What system was chosen? Um, in other words, would the outcome of the 2011 uh, elections have been different under different electoral formulas, even within the family of pro list proportional representation formulas? And the answer there is yes, in a big way, and I'm going to explain that a little bit. Um, and then the second question I want to address is, what formula uh, should Tunisia consider, if any, alternative uh, in future elections? And I'll, I'll get to that a little bit later. So. Uh, another one of the pictures that I would have shown you here is a, a picture of the uh, electoral district map of Tunisia, but those of you who, who know Tunisia better than I probably can pick, put this together in your head, um, so you don't need to look at it, but um, what, I, what I wanted to emphasize there is that the vast majority of representatives in the Tunisian Constituent Assembly were chosen from districts of what I call moderate magnitude, between uh, five and nine members. Big enough for some element of proportionality, is it small enough uh, for um, uh, some element of personal accountability? We also know that the, the, the structure of competition was one of you know, one really big actor, NADA, uh, which won about 37% of the vote in the constituent assembly elections. And that was more than four times larger than the next biggest competitor. So you have one really big uh, actor and then uh, a long tail uh, in the distribution of much smaller actors. Um, over 20% of the vote in the 2011 elections was won by lists that won no representation in the parliament at all. Okay, so what that means, and this is going to be a critical concept in, in my comments, is that, um, so if you get 20% of the vote going to parties that, that weren't big enough to win any representation, that means that there's, uh, 
there's bonus material available, which is to say that the parties that did win some representation are gonna share that 20% of available bonus in the seats. Um, and the big question, the huge question for the choice of electoral formula is, how are you gonna divide up that windfall? How are you gonna divide up that bonus among the winners? Um, and so, we get into the arithmetic next, and this is the slide with the, the numbers on it, or one of them. Um, and the, the point I want to make here is this. In, in the world of formulas for converting votes into seats, and really we're still just talking about within the world of proportional representation systems, there are two big families of formulas. Okay? One of them is called quota and largest remainders formulas, and the other one is called divisors formulas. I'm going to focus on the first one because this is where Tunisia is. Tunisia chose uh, a formula called the hair quota with largest remainders. Okay. What does that mean? It means that within every one of the districts, the way that they decided how to allocate seats is they established first a quota that lists could use to purchase a seat. And the quota is the total number of votes cast in the district for everybody divided by the number of seats available. So if there are 100,000 votes cast in a district and there were 10, list, uh, 10 seats in the district, then the, the quota is 10,000 votes. That's the retail price of a seat in that district. So the way you proceed is you look at the votes that all the parties got. First, you calculate the quota, it's 10,000 votes. You look around and you say, anybody have 10,000 votes? And if Nada, for instance, won 35,000 votes in the district, they've got three full quotas, they get three seats at the retail price. And then you look and you say, anybody else got any, anyone else got 10,000 votes? And maybe Congress for the Republic had 10,000, had 11,000 votes. So they've got one quota, okay, that's the fourth seat. But now, Nobody else has any full quotas anymore, and we still got six seats to distribute. How do we do it? This is where we move to the largest remainders section of the formula. We look around and we say, after we've su subtracted 30,000 uh, votes from Hanada's total, their quotas that they spent to purchase their first three seats, and after we've subtracted 10,000 votes from Congress for the Republic's total, what's the order of votes remaining? And uh, we just allocate the remaining six seats to the top six remainder totals. Okay, what does this mean? This means this is a very good system for small parties. Because there's a retail price, and that's a high price to pay for a seat, and there's a, a wholesale price, and that's a low price. And so what happened in Tunisia in 2011 is that the majority of seats in the Constituent Assembly were purchased wholesale, not retail, because the vote was so highly fragmented. That was good for small parties. They, they, won, they did pretty well. Okay. Quota and remainder systems have this two-tier pricing system. The other types of systems, divisor systems, deny. So what I did is I then did a simulation. I got the raw data at the district level from the 2011 elections. And I calculated, first of all, recalculated how the, the votes were, how the seats were distributed under the hair quota and largest remainder system. But I also calculated simulated outcomes under all the other potential formulas that there are out there used around the world in other countries. Because around, other, around the world, uh, countries use all kinds of different formulas. Perfectly democratic countries use all kinds of different formulas. What I was interested in is, would the distribution of those bonus representation have been different under other formulas? Like I said, the answer is yes, emphatically. So, one of the things I would have shown you is a table with way too many numbers for you to have digested in, in this context, um, but that shows you the seat distributions under all the other major formulas that are out there. Numbers are hard to look at, pictures are easier to look at, so let's look at the second page that I've given to you. And this one is, uh, shows these graphs. So, what these graphs plot is the bonus or penalty if the number is negative. Uh, the, the, the winner's bonus or loser's penalty uh, on the y-axis versus, on, on the x-axis, the, the share of vote that each party won nationwide. And each graph represents a simulation of a different electoral formula applied to these same outcomes of 2011. The one on the top left, the seat bonus under HQLR, that's hair quota largest remainders, that actually shows what happened in Tunisia in 2011. Here's what I want to suggest. When I talked about economies of moderate scale, 
Economies of moderate scale means that we should be providing bonuses, uh, we, should provi we should be providing incentives for groups that are in that low to moderate range of voter support, say 5 to 15 percent, to coalesce into larger alliances of say 25, 30 percent of the electorate. Uh, so what you want to have is a concave function. Right? We've got these curves that are drawn here, but what you want to have is a system that gives you incentives for moderate-sized groups to coalesce into larger ones. That's going to have to come at some cost. Okay? And what inevitably happens in election systems around the world is that the very small parties pay a price. They're the ones whose penalty makes possible the bonuses for other groups. So, under my simulations, I calculated what those curves look like. Are they concave or are they convex? Uh, how steep are they in various neighborhoods of voter support, and it turns out that the, the system that uh, was chosen for the 2011 elections does pretty well by these standards. Um, it's uh, concave, it does pretty well by the moderate-sized parties, but there are some areas in which it's not so good. And so I'll, I'll skip to the bottom line here, is that there are other options as well. Um, and I offer one uh, in my paper, which is uh, at the district level operates with <coughs> but then uh, takes those remainders, okay? Because here's what I think the big, uh, the big liability to the system that the Tunisians chose is this. It creates an incentive for small groups to remain small, which is to say, because you have a two-tiered pricing system, you win some seats at wholesale, but if you're small, you really only have a chance to win seats at the retail level. And under this system, if you're winning at the retail level, or you have a chance to be in the game, I'm sorry, at the wholesale level, across a bunch of districts, you have an incentive not to coalesce and not to form the building blocks of a viable governing alliance. So there are ways to get around this. There are ways basically to get um, you know, similar kind of good treatment of small groups without creating that incentive for fragmentation. And in my paper, I suggest some ways to do this. Now, I'll close by um, saying that uh, you know, I did these simulations uh, for the Tunisian 2011 elections. And if you look at that second handout, you can see that the differences across the formulas are really dramatic in terms of um, how they reward and punish certain parties and lists. For instance, had Tunisia chosen the second most common proportional formula used around the world, what's called the dot divisor formula, same distribution of votes would have given to Nada 66% uh, of the seats in the Constituent Assembly. That's a huge difference. We wouldn't have a coalition. We wouldn't have co as much compromise, I don't think. It's fair to say. Um, and, uh, you know, so, so the choice matters a lot. Now, the choice mattered a whole lot in Tunisia 2011, and more than it would uh, in most other contexts, and probably more than it will in the future in Tunisia for a couple of reasons. It matters a lot because of the moderate district magnitude that Tunisia has chosen. That's a good thing. But it also matters a lot because the vote was as highly fragmented as it was. Now, going forward, I don't expect the vote to be as hugely fragmented as it was in 2011. I don't think anyone does. Um, as, the, as the vote support consolidates, the differences between the formulas will moderate a bit. They won't be quite as stark, but they'll still matter, and they'll matter quite a bit. So it's an important choice. Um, as, the Tun as Tunisia goes forward, which formula they're going to use. I would suggest uh, three things that they want, that, that, that Tunisia probably wants to avoid. One is you, the country wants to avoid any reforms that make the system more complex. There tends to be, uh, a, a, there's a tendency, not only in, in countries in this part of the world, although it's present in Egypt, it's present in Libya, um, to m try to have a little of this and a little of that and a little of the next thing in your electoral system. And one of the manifestations of this is these systems that choose you know, two, two different parallel kinds of electoral rules going on at the same time, like in Egypt and in Libya, to, to elect a single assembly. I think Tunisia would really be well advised to avoid that, because not only does it make the system more complicated for voters to interact with, but it creates all kinds of strategic complexities for politicians that um, I think are counterproductive. The second thing that Tunisia should avoid is any kind of reform that would lock in really big winners' bonuses, like the dot divisor system, for instance, or a single member district system that would, would give all the representation in the district to, to, to whoever comes in first place. Um, and the third thing I think that, that needs to is a concern is um, they should 
this is a reform I'd like to see, some kind of a reform to eliminate this incentive for staying small, for what I call hunting seats by remainders, uh, as opposed to coalescing into big groups. So what are the big, what are the options that are available? Um, I, I, I lay some of these out in my paper and I won't, I won't, uh, I know I'm out of time, so I won't uh, belabor the point here. But there are some options that can maintain uh, the, the inclusiveness of the current system without uh, generating these incentives for fragmentation. Uh, you could do that by pooling the remainders up to the national level and reallocating seats that way. You could do that by adopting a divisor-based system as long as it is sufficiently progressive. Um, the other option would be just to maintain the status quo, and I'll close with this, which is, the choices that were made in 2011, they weren't perfect, I don't think, but in comparative perspective, they were remarkably good. And I think the top priority for electoral reformers in Tunisia going forward is not to jeopardize uh, the really solid choices, uh, that, that the solid foundation that was laid in the 2011 election. Thank you. Thanks very much. I just want to note that the, uh, the John's presentation that he was hoping to have on the screen uh, here today uh, will be available on the uh, CSID website uh, so that all of you can uh, go back through that and, and look at some of the visuals that you prepared. Uh, we're going to take uh, about 15 to 20 minutes now uh, for questions and 15 minutes for questions and answers. Uh, so if you have any questions, if you could, I ask you to please uh, go over to the microphone that's uh, in this aisle here and line up there and we'll take those questions and then give our panelists an opportunity uh, to respond. And, and, yeah, if you could please uh, briefly uh, state your name and affiliation and then and try to keep your questions uh, brief because uh, we I see already, already a large number of people uh, lining up. Please. Hello, I'm David Mack from the Middle East Institute, and my question is directed toward Redwan. Um, you gave us an intriguing comment about um, the nature of establishing consensus for the Constitution. Could you please describe at least one really uh, potentially divisive issue and how the, um, the different factions within the Tunisian body politic are dividing up on that issue. Yes. I'm Joseph Kikasola from Regent University in Virginia Beach, Virginia. And I have a question for Joelle Thies. Thank you very much for your comments about blasphemy laws, anti-blasphemy laws. And uh, I think that's such a pertinent point and I appreciate the work of the Human Rights First I was just wondering, are you aware of the danger of the current revisions that the OIC have put forward, the Organization of Islamic Cooperation? And let me just read to you one sentence that stuck out to me. This is in their resolution, the United Nations General Assembly, 1618. It says, terrorism cannot and should not be associated with any religion, nationality, civilization, or ethnic group. That's really deceitful. It's logical nonsense. Obviously, we cannot associate terrorism with any uh, nationality, civilization, or ethnic group because these are immutables. I can't change my parents. I can't change my nation. These things are givens. But when they say it cannot and should not be applied to any religion, we know that religion is different from all of these. It's a matter of choice. And violent people can choose violent doctrines within their religion or invent them. We know that is so. And uh, I've suspected for quite some time that this kind of language, in the name of defamation, what they really want to resurrect is the old Sharia doctrine of criminalizing speech, which is critical of Islam. I would like your comment on the OIC. Next. Thank you. My name is Ty Matz, and this question is also for Radwan. Um, you, you emphasized that numerous occasions during your talk today about how important it is for democracy to take root in Tunisia in order for it to stand a chance elsewhere in the Arab world. And I guess, I, I, I'm wondering if you could expound on that and talk about the transmission mechanisms in order for some type of democratic lessons learned in Tunisia in order to move elsewhere into Egypt, 
uh, Libya uh, and elsewhere in the region. I think that we saw certainly the negative demonstration effects in early 2011, but how can we see that positive transmission mechanism? Thanks. My name is Peter Mandeville from George Mason University. It's a question for John Perry. Um, John, you've spoken a lot about how different technical models might produce different sorts of outcomes. And I'm, I'm very conscious of the fact that when we think about political transitions, people often talk about that all-important second election, right? The first election takes place often in a pre-political environment where there's a technocratic leadership in place and the choice of the system can, in a sense, be politically neutral. Then you have a shelling, right? Certain groups prove themselves to have certain levels of support amongst the population, and so inevitably the choice of future systems becomes a political question. I was wondering if you might be able to talk a little bit about anything along the lines of best practices for how you kind of manage the, the governance of election system decision making, you know, for subsequent elections. Mary, in Ottawa, with the Woodrow Wilson Center. Uh, my uh, uh, comment really goes to what uh, Joel was saying, but it really has broader implications. Uh, I don't want to sound as if I defended blasphemy laws. That's certainly not my intention. But you said something about blasphemy laws dif dividing the society. No, the, the society is divided, and I think removing the blasphemy <laughs> laws would be as offensive to some people and would be divide the society in the same way. I think if you divide, if you eliminate the blasphemy laws, I think Salafis would still go after uh, exhibitions. So I think it's important not to, co uh, not only not to confuse cause and effect, but also, uh, you know, I think we need to raise the issue whether the question of tolerance applies to everybody. That is, it only applies because essentially we are, uh, we are expecting greater tolerance from people who espouse conservative values. But I wonder whether in this transitional situation, it's also important for groups that espouse liberal values to be more, more tolerant. Thank you, Dr. Basli. Um, uh, uh, first of all, I would like to, at the very outset, I would like to thank Radwan for his uh, kind of invitation because I came straight away from Tunisia to attend this meeting. And uh, I'm very pleased to be with you today. And I would like to say a few, few comments about what Radwan said, which I do agree, actually, uh, with everything he said, almost, except one or two points. I want to emphasize on it. Uh, let me remind the audience that Tunisia, uh, women in Tunisia, were enjoying uh, equality gender by law. And the civil society in Tunisia was implemented since 1965. Bourguiba at that time has built a nation, which is Tunisia first. And this is the main issue. It is true that we are about to reach a compromise about the draft of the Constitution. Thanks to all people, all leaders, all Tunisian citizens, but particularly because, thanks to the women, because women in Tunisia are providing us a very strong shield <coughs> against any backwards, any obscurantism or fundamental, or most of fundamentals, whatever, is the reason of this fundamentalism. So this is the richness of Tunisia today, is the equality gender that had been provided, that had been implemented, because at the end of the 50s, at the beginning of the 60s, women in Tunisia were elected, can elect and can be elected, which was not the case of the French woman. Women in Tunisia can abort. Women in Tunisia can, can divorce. This situation was not available even in Europe, which is uh, the, 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 the civilization which colonized us for, for decades uh, before. This is what Nahda understood, actually. And this is why I do believe, because he spoke about Nahda, the political party, Nahda was ruling with the two secular parts of the country. Nahda understood, at the end of the day, that they cannot actually change what Tunisian society is. And this is a very positive political move that I, I have to highlight here in Washington. I belong to, I am a Tunisian citizen, 
I worked with the previous regime. I worked as an ambassador. I worked as a governor. But it doesn't mean that today we are not going forward to a better future for Tunisia where democracy has to be implemented, where democracy and the rule of law has to be implemented today. We are indeed the best case in the Arab world to be about to succeed in this political transition. And we do believe that democracy is not Western values, it's international value, it's humanitarian, humanitarian values. For this reason, we consider that being part of the humanity as a whole, we have the right to implement democracy with our identity, with our knowledge, with our Islam, with our understanding of Islam, which is one of the most popular and, uh, let's say, uh, <coughs> progressive religion that exists on earth. Let me finish with one sentence. I have attended many conferences like this one. I recall one conference in Madrid talking about dialogue between civilization. And one Tunisian thinker has concluded his remark by saying, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity is no longer in fashion for the humanity. There, is, there will be one new religion beyond the 21st centuries. That was in 1999. Beyond the 21st century, there will be new religion for all over the world within this globalization. The new religion of the whole world will be democracy. Thank you very much. Okay, we have just time for one last question. If I could ask you, please keep it very brief, uh, so we have time for our panelists to answer, and then we need to get everyone to, to lunch. Thanks. I'm a Tunisian woman's judge. I'm president of Women's Lawyers Association, and uh, I'm example uh, for uh, what uh, the uh, previous has uh, um, I think that uh, all countries in, transition, in uh, transitions face a certain number of conflicts, such as the conflicts of vision. And the question that must be posed is whether choice government that can be provided by a single party or by vol voluntary coalition. As an answer, I think that the Tunisian example, Troika, which included another party and two other parties, uh, is a model for building a real democracy there. And uh, I, uh, I agree with Dr. Sourj when he said that the independence of judiciary is the heart of democracy. But really, the urgent question is how, we, how to reform judicial system two years after the revolution. We are in late because some corrupted judges are still there and some powerful and uh, it's a real danger for revolution. At uh, last, I agree with uh, uh, Dr. Radwan. Uh, uh, I'm optimist about the chances of success of the democratic transition in Tunisia because we are working hard now to rebuild institution, laws, and democratic culture. Thanks. Uh, I think we'll, we'll start at the far end with John and work this way, and uh, each of you could just uh, try to quickly respond to the questions that were addressed to you. Right, okay, so the question was really going forward about, uh, you know, what, what, what are the prospects for good practices in the governance of, of elections going forward, and it, it raises a really good point, you know, there's, um, there's always a tension uh, in, in you know, deciding how to run elections between what I'll call inertia and opportunism. And the inertia is, uh, comes from the fact that it's the parliament itself that makes the rules. Uh, and by definition, everybody sitting in the parliament won under the current rules. So that generates a certain amount of inertia. Um, but on the other hand, you've got opportunism, and, that, and, and uh, opportunism comes from the fact that you know, parties, especially once they start to develop pretty firm expectations about how big they're going to be, how much support they have, can then, they're in a much better position to tailor the rules uh, such that they benefit parties you know, like themselves. And so you yeah, have this tension going on, and really uncertainty is your friend. By, by that I mean uncertainty about um, who's going to be strong and who's going to be weak. Um, puts, tends to put parties behind a sort of Rawlsian veil of ignorance and encourage them to adopt neutral rules, or rules that will treat all parties consistently. Um, so, to the extent that uh, Tunisian voters are willing to move from one party to another, um, 
based on government performance or the performance of individual politicians, that will generate a certain amount of uncertainty and that'll keep the politicians honest, uh, or at least keep them neutral in their choice of rules. But beyond that, I'd, I'd make one other concrete recommendation, which is this. Apart from the rules you choose to run the election, there's also, there's also the rules for administering the election, or the actual administration of the election. And you need to have a, a, a body that is in charge of that. And on that count, um, I would point as an example to the decision that Mexico made about 20 years ago. Um, it used to be the case that elections in Mexico were run by the Ministry, Ministry of Interior, so it was part of the executive branch. About, I think it's about 20 years ago now, they created and empowered uh, an independent uh, electoral board. And here's the key point. The statute that creates that, that uh, electoral commission guarantees that no party holds a majority of the seats on it. Even if a party holds the presidency and a majority in both chambers of Congress, um, there's, you know, there's gonna be a division in that board such that no party can hold a majority of the seats in it. So it can't become, at least if the, if the, if the statute is honored, it can't become an arm of the, uh, of the incumbent government. And it's a, it's a bit of a, uh, a legal firewall that guarantees some neutrality in the administration of elections. Because re regardless of what kind of rules you've got, if they're not administered in a neutral and impartial way, you're not gonna end up with genuinely competitive elections. So that would be one recommendation I would make. And then a lot of other countries besides Mexico have analogous uh, boards, but the Mexican case is one that a lot of you may be familiar with, and uh, it, rec it represented a real turning point in the transition to a democracy in Mexico. Thanks. Well, assalamu alaikum. I, mean, I have a question to the chairman of the CSID. To you, Mr. Masoudi. Well, why? Yeah, I'm sorry, but we don't have time for additional questions. We just need to... Uh, Can we do it later in the next session? Yeah, but this is important for this session. Just one question. Okay. You take one bit. My, my name is Sayyid Ashra. I, I, I'm sorry. I, I, you're going to have to hold your question until the next session. I, I apologize. We're out of time, and we just need responses from our panelists, and then we have to get to lunch. So, sorry. Joel? Thank you. So thank you very much for your questions. Um, the first question uh, was the, the, I think, Yusa, about the, the UN resolution. Was that? Oh, Yusa, I'm, I apologize. Yes, so you were referring to the resolution 1618, which was adopted in March 2011, first by the Human Rights Council, and then the similar language of the General Assembly of the same year. This is a, a text that was, that broke uh, over a decade of a disagreement between the United States and the European Union on one hand and the Organization of the Islamic um, Cooperation on the other hand. And uh, it was a quite historical moment when everybody sat down to agree to take away the terminology of defamation of religions in a UN text. Now, I understand that you, are, you do not think that this text is perfect because guess what? No one thinks that this text is perfect, myself included. What it does, where we do support it, and where the United States supports it, um, is that it, it brings non-legal ways to fight hatred. Because even if you're against blasphemy, even if you're against, you know, you have to find ways to take hatred seriously in every single region of the world without always coming back to this controversial, radioactive subject of blasphemy that paralyzes everything and everyone as soon as we talk about hatred, about, about blasphemy. And so it's, it's a way to, to sort of um, find new solutions. Now, let's be honest. UN text is a corridor diplomacy negotiated between ambassadors in Geneva and, and in, in New York. It is not necessarily the reflection of reality. But what I'm interested in in this text, in the Resolution 1618, is that it stops providing cover through UN resolutions to national blasphemy laws. Meaning that OIC states afterwards can't say, well listen, you know, our domestic blasphemy law is perfectly legal because you have the terminology defamation of religions in the United Nations text. So it takes away that excuse and it enables us and governments and, uh, uh, around the world to fight human rights abuses caused by blasphemy laws on the ground in reality, as opposed to the United Nations meeting rooms. And so that's why I'm interested in it, because it takes away the cover that governments can, can, can use about, about this question. On the other question, which was about, um, so removing blasphemy would be offensive to other people. Uh, uh, the lady who answered, yes. 
So, I have a lot to say about this, but I'll, I'll, I'll reduce it to a couple of words. I, I, I do disagree with you that um, I think that it's important to dissociate blasphemy from incitement to hatred against Muslim individuals. I think people, you know, international law speaks about how it is illegal to incite to hatred against Muslim individuals. However, blasphemy is a completely different situation. Uh, blasphemy uh, is about criticizing ideas and criticizing religion. What I'm saying is that it's not the same thing to say I don't hate is I. It's not the same thing to say I hate Islam, or I think all Muslims are dangerous and should be immediately killed. It's two different things. Now you have the right to be offended by the person who says that he or she doesn't like Islam. You have the right to be offended. But guess what, being offended is, is legal under international law. What is illegal in international law is to incite hatred against the individuals of that faith. So there's a difference between hating an idea or hating a person because of his origins or beliefs or, or race or, relig or, or religion. And so, so that's where there's a, a, a difference. And I would say that Muslims are the first victims of blasphemy. Because any Muslim thinker who thinks a bit out of, outside of the state-defined uh, contours of Islam will also be a victim of, of, uh, of blasphemy. And so, it, it's, it, blasphemy provides a license for governments and judges and anybody else to, to just, you know, persecute somebody on the ground of his beliefs. But, um, so, so, you know, what, what is offensive, uh, democracy is based on people being, you have to be thick-skinned. You have to be offended in democracy. You, you have to, citizens have to toughen up and fight hate through more speech. That does not give them a license to violate international law and to incite against hatred against individuals. But if you're offended by an idea in democracy, so be it. So be it that uh, um, ideas offend. And, 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 and I think that one uh, barometer of, uh, of, of, of feeding a democratic society is when people you know, agree to disagree. Uh, but that does not mean, once again, that incitement to hatred against Muslim individuals is permitted. Absolutely not. If somebody incites to hatred against Muslim individuals, not against Islam, but against individuals, then it is perfectly illegal. So that's what I would say about your comments. Very quickly, I know we're all uh, hungry and tired. Very quickly, uh, David, uh, you asked about um, divisive issues in the Constitution. There, we started, there were a lot. There were uh, at least 20, maybe more, issues in the Constitution that were divisive. Uh, there is a book outside on the table that uh, shows an example of six issues. CSID organized six closed workshops and brought about 30 people, 10 from uh, the assembly, who are actually writing the constitution, the committee that's writing that portion of the constitution, 10 from poli the main political parties, and 10 from civil society. For two and a half days on each issue, they were discussing it until they come, and we had facilitators, uh, trained facilitators, to try to facilitate the discussion until they come with the, uh, to a consensus or to an agreement that everybody uh, agrees with. Uh, so we actually, th this is why I'm very uh, optimistic that most of these issues have been resolved. Uh, right now I think we, we are left with basically three issues that are still a uh, little bit hanging in there, but I think we're very close to, to resolving them. Uh, just two weeks ago we had two major uh, national dialogue conferences uh, that brought together all the main uh, parties. Um, I think there is still a little bit of debate about uh, the freedom to strike in the Constitution. Some people want it unlimited, and some people want some constraints on freedom to strike, but with some uh, limitations. There is an issue of freedom of conscience. Uh, there is freedom of religion in the Constitution right now. Some people want to uh, expand it into freedom of uh, conscience in general, meaning that freedom to be uh, atheist or not to believe in any religion uh, at all. Um, and I think they are close to a consensus on that. And the most difficult issue has been the issue of uh, the, the political system, the type of regime, presidential versus uh, uh, parliamentarian, 
Uh, I think we're also close on, uh, to, a, to a consensus on that, but that has been very, very difficult because the, the consensus has been to build a semi-presidential, so somewhere in between the presidential and parliamentarian. But the devil is in the detail and how you split the, the tasks and the responsibilities between the president and the prime minister, uh, I think has been a, a, a very contentious issue. Um, the, the last question, there was another question about the transmission mechanisms between uh, Tunisia and, and uh, other Arab countries. Uh, and um, I think these countries are much closer uh, to each other than we realize. I mean, there is a lot more, and they are learning from each other, they are closely watching uh, each other. Uh, a lot of Libyans come to Tunisia, a lot of Tunisians go to Libya and, and, and Egypt uh, and so on. People are really trying to learn from each other so that, uh, you know, we don't repeat the same mistakes or we see what works and, and learn from it. So I, I do believe that if Tunisia succeeds, it will be a big, big boost uh, for the other regions uh, because there is a lot of, uh, uh, you know, exchanges. Uh, first of all, the power of proof. It will be the first time that a, a true democracy succeeds in the Arab world. It will prove that we are capable of doing it. This is, this is very important. It, it's the, the demonstration, it demonstrates that it can be done. And I think this will really s strengthen uh, the, 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 the belief and, and, the, and, the, and, and the attachment to democracy because it is starting to waver because of all the problems. People are thinking, oh, maybe it's difficult, maybe we cannot do it. But also, it also shows how it can be done. Not only that we can do it, but it shows an, a model for how you reconcile all these issues and how you build a balanced system. So it also provides a model uh, that the people can not necessarily emulate exactly, but learn from it and, and try to, to, to see how it actually can be done. So I, d I really do honestly believe that um, success in Tunisia will be, uh, will, will will be transmitted or will, will encourage and, and will support uh, the democratic transitions in other countries. Thanks very much, uh, and uh, we're going to head now directly to the uh, luncheon where we'll have a few fe featured speakers there as well. Uh, just very quickly, luncheon is in the pavilion, and uh, there will be big signs outside that show us where we go to the pavilion. Uh, when we come back after lunch, we will have two separate uh, parallel sessions. One will be in this room, and one will be in the room across. So please try to... Uh, uh, we also have, I think, three speakers in, in the over lunch, so we're going to have to try to catch up a little bit with, uh, with our delays. Thank you very much. Thank <laughs> you.